that lemon flavor, that food flavor, co- you know, could be coconut or cucumber or anything, excites the system and sends the communication to the body that food is incoming. So we don't want any food flavors or any nutrients because we want to put the body into a complete digestive rest. Take your supplements in your eating window, because those supplements are food, (laughs) you know, B12 and vitamin C and D is fat soluble. It has to be taken with food anyway. And so have your supplements in your eating window. Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies, welcome to part two of my interview with Lori Lewis. And today I'm going to be talking about my experience with three weeks of fasting since I first talked to Lori. Because let's face it, she and I were were talking all about the benefits of fasting. We know that there's benefits out there, but yet it's kind of overplayed. I'm not going to lie. Fasting, you know, you're probably like, oh, God, not another fasting podcast. But I had to rethink a couple of things because I was having some trouble with weight coming off and I had stopped fasting because I was thinking that maybe I was doing it for too long and maybe it was getting a little weird because I was basically not eating and my weight was still (laughs) staying plateaued or going up. I'm sure you can resonate with this. I'm human. Yes, I'm a doctor, but I'm still on a quest to figure things out and, and we have blind spots when we try to do it ourselves. This is why having a guide is absolutely key. So I took Lori's challenge to retry it and I got some success. I'm going to share it in the podcast with you. So let's reintroduce you to Fast Forward Wellness's Lori Lewis. Hey, Hell Junkies. So I am here with Lori Lewis and we have had three weeks since our our last chat. And after our last chat, we, of course, um, spent a little time talking, talking about fasting, talking about some of my struggles that I was having with my health and my weight. And so Lori challenged me to try a different type of fasting for myself and see how it worked. So in three weeks, I have lost four pounds and yeah, things feel good. And I'm going to just jump in because I I want this to be for you guys, a learning experience of kind of how fasting can work, but also the little intricacies and how I came to the conclusion that maybe it's time to try this again. All right. So Lori Lewis, welcome back to the Health Fix Podcast. Hello, hello. (laughs) Good to be back. I'm always excited to hear what's actually happening, right? Because we can hypothesize and theorize and read about it and wonder about it. But then you jumped in and you're like, okay, even though I'm going on a trip, even though I'm living my life, I'm gonna yeah, test it out. So what happened? How do you, first off, I always ask, how do you feel? So I know you said you lost four pounds, but what I really care about is how did this fasting clean and having an eating window play out in your life? And most importantly, how do you feel? Yeah, great question. And guys, by the way, for those of you guys listening, I'm taking doctor out of the equation. I'm being I'm being me as me because, you know, let's face this, ladies, sometimes we'll go straight to the weight. And if we haven't lost weight, but we feel good, we're going to be disappointed. But here's the thing. I, I do feel good. I feel like my body is not overloaded with food. I do feel a lot better. I feel lighter. I like how I feel right now. I feel lighter. I feel lighter. Let's put it that way. Just lighter in general, not lighter, just weight. Lighter in general. Exactly. That is one of the words that people use the most. And they say exactly what you just said. They're like, I feel lighter, but I don't mean my physical self. I mean, just a buoyancy, a clarity, kind of a, a lightness. <laughs> and um, so it's been three weeks. You've, you feel light, you feel well. And one ac- access to that is you can think about your energy throughout the day or your energy right now, or your clarity, your ability to get things done, your ability to focus. And so if you're feeling well, and you lost four pounds, share with us what your fasting 
hours were like for you? And then when was your eating window and what felt good? Yeah. So I went back to some of my old days of fasting and was like, when did I feel the best? And it was when I cut food off earlier in the evening. My body does not like to eat late. I don't feel good eating late. I think a lot of people I know definitely have have expressed that to me as well. And of course, we know the liver time, right, of, of when it's processing things. But more or less, I ended up in the 11 to 4, so 11 a.m. to about 4 p.m. or 11 a.m. to about 5 p.m. 11 a.m. is when I naturally start to feel hungry. And really, after 5 p.m., I don't really care to eat, which is interesting, right? Because a lot of people will talk about this as a time when they want to snack, things of that nature. And that's I, I feel just way down if I eat late. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So see, I think you set out to have an eight hour eating window. And then what naturally happened was about a five or a six hour eating window. And so I call that. So for people who are just hearing this the first time, when you're just starting out, start with a 12 hour fast. So decide today what time you're closing your eating window, drink plain water, go to bed, wake up, you know, add 12 hours. And at the 12 hour mark, if you're really not hungry, keep fasting until you're ready to open your eating window with your coffee, the way you like it with stuff in it or with, you know, a breakfast or a lunch. So, and then gradually move from that 12, 12 to a 16, eight, which would mean a 16 hour fast. You're moving up from 12 to 12 and a half to 13, 13, half. get to 16 hour fast and an eight hour eating window, and then settle into that eight hour eating window and see how you feel and see what happens. Because the way to figure out the perfect eating window for you is how do you feel? So we covered that. You feel, it feels good. You just, you know, you feel great. Um, The second thing is it's got to work with your life and your daily schedule and the people in it. And the third one is we want to reach that, that schedule that you settle into has to reach or maintain your health goals and health and weight goals. So you've got to feel good. It's got to work with your life and it's got to help you reach or maintain your health goals. So um, what else would you say since you've kind of settled into this 11 to five, um, what other uh, health markers and health issues other than weight did you want to move the needle on? Well, I mean, really I have digestive issues as as I, I believe I mentioned in the previous podcast and yeah. then my peanut my peanut thing I discovered. But I also think that I, I am sensitive to weed. I think I'm sensitive to dairy, kind of the most common things that yeah. people will tend to have issues with. And I'm I notice that in the window of eating between eleven and four or five, I didn't really tend to want those kind of things. I was just kind of pushing those out and focusing more on protein and veggies. That was kind of what my body was craving. So I was able to listen more, I think. Oh, that is so perfect. So would you say, Janine, that you, one thing that could help people is a lot of people do have a late night eating, snacking, Mm -hmm. drinking habit. And many, I would say most people feel like eating late at night is their one of their biggest challenges with food because they finish their dinner and then they go sit in their favorite chair and they have their normal routine. And at some point their brain lights up and says, mm-hmm, what, let's have this. <laughs> and they're off and running. Um, so I really encourage people to have a hard stop with their eating window, just like a hard stop. Like I, I, don't eat until whatever time. And I don't eat past this time and to establish for themselves that hard stop and what I call an um, eating window closing ritual. So Mm -hmm. if you were to look at your four or five uh, stop, that's naturally occurring now, is there a ritual that you have? Are there a few steps that you do even without thinking about it to close your eating window that could include you know, wiping off the kitchen counter, turning off the kitchen light, pouring a glass of sparkling water, high-fiving your husband that your eating windows closed. I don't know. It could be anything. Like, is there a, are there a series of steps that you either do or could take to close your eating window? Interesting. I didn't really think about it. 
I think for me, I'm very mechanical. If I tell myself I'm going to do something and that's the time it's happening. I, I, oh, you're so I, rare. <laughs> yeah, rare. I, I'm, I might be on that, res that respect. Yeah. I think I've also gotten to the point now, just I, I'll be completely honest, like with all of the food issues I've had and the digestive pain and different things that I, I, I kind of started to not like food and not care um, yeah. anymore. So I think there is a little bit of that. Um, what I will say, the difference between 4 and 5 p.m. is really my schedule. And when I can make the food, um, yes, that that's pretty much the only thing between there. So, yeah, I mean, I guess one of the things you have to think about with fasting, I mean, as you're you're getting into your new window, right, is being like, oh, what time is it? Oh, I probably should just stop now. So, you know, no more in the mouth. So, yeah, probably cl cleaning up the kitchen and putting things away so nothing's sitting on the counter would be a good ritual in this case so that yeah. you're not going back for more. Exactly. That's great. Because if you clean and you, if the lights are out and you step away from it, there's no reason to go back in there. I, I also want to say that there could be people out there listening who think I could never close my eating window at four or five because of the timing of their commute and their family and their, you know, sport and, and so forth. So that's okay. Yeah. I don't, I just want to make sure I know that you are not saying everybody else needs to close their eating window at four or five. That's what has you feel your very best. So people need to think about starting with 12, 12 fasting clean, which is plain unflavored water, plain unflavored black coffee, plain unflavored, bitter, black or green tea, plain unflavored electrolytes. So you could put a little salt under your tongue if you feel woozy or take a magnesium and then your medication. So that's the clean fast. And then you start with 12, 12 and inch up to 16, eight and play around with that eight hour eating window. Some people might love an eight hour eating window from one to nine or two to 10, you know, <laughs> based mm -hmm. on there. And then they might figure out, you know what? I feel better having a little bite of something at three and then working and then going home and then making my dinner and having a big dinner at seven, having a little something at eight 30 and closing it by nine. Like, it's, yeah. And then people might feel like, you know, I can eat just as much in six hours as I could eat in eight. I don't need that whole eight hours. And so, and then other people who are super fit and have no body, very low body fat and no health issues, they might find a 10 hour eating window is great for them. So it's really customized. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, Ultimately, yes, I'm more hungry at 11. I chose the time frame because that's when I have a natural break in my schedule for work. And then I chose stopping eating at four or five because I'm I work I'm in on central time, but I work on Pacific time. And so now I'm just starting to see patients for the evening at that time frame. So if I done I'm done eating and then I go into seeing patients, it makes the transition, I think, easier too, if we're looking at, you know, trying to help folks look around on around their schedule. For sure. Perfect. Okay. So you definitely tick the first two boxes. You feel really well. It works with your daily schedule and your life. And then the third piece of it is the third leg of the stool is, are you able to reach or maintain and maintain your health and weight goals? And so right now the scale is moving. Mm -hmm. And are there other things that you have on what I call your dashboard that you're measuring? Because if the first thing we're looking at is how do you feel? That's, you know, right. glaring, flashing lights at the top of the dashboard. How do you feel? And then one of the data points on your dashboard is a scale. Um, I also encourage people to take a measurement of their waist because that's not a, met a, a vanity metric. It's a metabolic health indicator. Mm -hmm. So you want your waist to be less than half your height. So a quick waist measurement. You could take a picture of your face or your body. You could have an article of non-stretch clothing that you know for sure that you know how that item fits and you would be able to tell quite easily if it was changing. Is there anything, Janine, that you want to add to your dashboard in addition to how do you feel and the scale? Yeah. So we've been measuring my arms, legs, waist all along here throughout my journey with, with my fitness coach, trying to see if we can get some change there. And yes, my waist did go down about an inch. Um, it's, it's now slowly starting to go down. I imagine that it will, will do more over time. So yeah, that's one of them. The other one's looking at inflammation markers. So C-reactive yes. protein looking at 
you know, insulin resistance. That was something that guys, Lori and I talked about, but it, just because of me traveling and whatnot, it was just not going to happen for me to see where things are at. And I can definitely look at that. I can look at my liver function. I can look at triglycerides. So triglycerides are your carbs that turn to fat, um, simply stated, and they can also be another marker of insulin resistance. You know, I can look at definitely more things, right? Right. And see, see where, where things are at, you know, and, and also sleep quality. I mean, there, there's a lot of other things to assess here. And, and so, yeah, I would probably start with the lab metrics though, because that is what I'm used to using. And yeah, it would be interesting to see if a little bit more insulin resistance came down. Um, I love it. Getting that fasting insulin test is so important. And the range says below 20, but we really want it below five, the fasting insulin. And what would, I'm going to ask you a question. What would you say, I find with my clients that they get a lot of pushback when they ask their doctor, because the doctors usually blame the insurance companies, but for a fasting insulin test, how can we get more people <laughs> to get a fasting insulin test? Um, I know you can go to yourlabwork.com and pay $35 and go in and get it, but do you have any tips for people to understand the importance of insulin resistance and getting that fasting insulin number? You know, I think it's really it's incredibly important for any woman over 35, I think, in, in this case, regardless of whether you're trying to lose weight or or what, it sets you up for knowing what's going on metabolically. I think men too, it's it's important to just know what's going on metabolically. And because your doc won't, won't look at this normally, unless you really ask, and even then, yes, insurance will be the kickback there, your doc can put abnormal glucose results you know, it, it is a code, ICD-10 code is what we use. And easy enough, they could put that. Um, if your doctor's open to being coached a little, tell them like, hey, you could use a R73.09 abnormal glucose. So um, if they put the abnormal glucose, then the insurance would allow a look-see into the insulin? I can't guarantee it. But That's for so a lot interesting. Of, I knew I was going to learn something new from you. That's amazing. Yep. R73.09 okay. is abnormal glucose. You can, I mean, you could call your insurance, wow. right? The, I don't know the CPT. So CPT, insurance is speaking code. I don't know the CPT code for fasting insulin, but if you look up LabCorp, well, here, we can solve it for people right now if I look it up for all of you. So and CPT while you're, code. Lab. While you're doing that, I I want people to understand that Insulin is dysfunction, having dysregulated or insulin that's off is a precursor to having your blood sugar that's off, but they don't test insulin because if it comes back abnormal, there's nothing they tell you to do about it. They're not going to say, oh, you should be an intermittent faster. This will turn that around. And so um, they wait until the glucose is off so that then you are in the pre-diabetes or diabetes range, and then they can prescribe metformin to you or what have you. So um, I, I think that we need to be looking more upstream at what's causing all the metabolic diseases, as opposed to waiting until they arrive on our doorstep and knowing our fasting insulin number is really helpful for understanding where we're at. So I, what did you find? I agree. I agree. It's for, for lab core and for folks who are listening from the U S this is U S um, insurance code speak. I don't know for other countries, but insulin CPT. So C is in cat, P is in Paul, P or T is in Tom. So C is in cat, P is in Paul, T is in Tom. It's 83525. So that is what you want to ask your insurance. And then the ICD-10 code that you want to, to say to your insurance is for abnormal um, glucose. And that one, like I said before, is, and I'm double checking, yep, it's R73.09. Um, things that I have swirling and memorized in my head. Now, there's also E as an egg, 88.81, which is metabolic syndrome, which is also another code that yeah. we could, could use and see. Now, not all insurance have high priority on that code, which makes no sense, but Anyway, I, I, I just play the game. I'm not making the rules. Um, well, so the reason we're talking about insulin is because with a daily 
clean fasting schedule and having an eating window, we can normalize that insulin and it will come down. And that is another, you know, we're talking about what do you have on your dashboard and um, having that insulin number come down is really exciting. And uh, it mm-hmm. indicates that a person has stronger, better metabolic health and um, a, a way that a person could ask their doctor just starting out is, could you include, could you order a fasting insulin test? And if they say why, you say, because I really don't want to be pre-diabetic or diabetic. And I know you're testing my A1C, but let's also take a look at the insulin. And if they push back, you could just say, I want to make sure I'm not insulin resistant. And then from there, you could tell them all those codes and so forth. But hopefully more and more physicians are understanding that we don't want to be insulin resistant. We want to be insulin sensitive. And then what we all have in our back pocket as a way to stay insulin sensitive is to fast every day and have an eating window. So that's why we're here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's really important for folks to understand, you know, your doctor works for you um, at the end of the day. If they don't yes. order it, then okay, fine. You know, one backup that they may that that may be considered more acceptable than just the fasting insulin is that there is an IR insulin resistance marker with yes. with a cholesterol panel. So if your doctor is going to be running your cholesterol, you can ask for something called an N is in Nancy, M is in Mary, R is in Ralph lipo profile and with insulin resistance markers, with IR markers. And so your doc may be more inclined to do that. What that NMR is, is it shows your particle sizes of your cholesterol. And so if you already have elevated cholesterol, you can ask for that too. So another way to- I love that. So now we've got all the legs of the stool. We've got how you feel. Does it work with your life? And is the uh, fasting schedule that you settle into going to help you achieve and maintain your your health goals? So you got to have more things on that dashboard than the scale. <laughs> so yeah. people are like, I tried intermittent fasting. It didn't work for me. I, I get very curious. What did you try? Were you fasting clean? How long were you, was your daily fast? How long did you try it for? You know, then it's like, what were you eating? And, and then we figure out, you know, what actually was and wasn't working <laughs> and we, cause we want to get everybody feeling really amazing. Right. Right. Yeah. What I have found is that with all these gadgets, they are a massive distraction and a confusion. So again, we want to figure out the daily fasting schedule that makes your life easier. It's like decision fatigue melts away. You just don't have to think about it anymore. This is the time that I eat. When I'm burning body fat or when I'm in a fasted state, I actually feel so well. And we want to figure out what is that daily schedule for each individual. And if you're breathing into that thing and it's telling you that you're not allowed to eat yet because of whatever the numbers are, but that messes with your day. And then you've got to go into a meeting or you really need to eat lunch or you're, if you don't eat until later, you're going to feel terrible. This is a, this is upsetting for and confusing for people. So I really encourage people to tune into what is having you feel amazing, what works for your life, and then what's on your dashboard. What numbers do you want to see moving um, so that you know that it is working, um, that your body is shifting, that you are getting healthier, but feeling well and having it work with your life is everything. So as soon as we add a gadget into the mix, that can really mess us up. And we can get a little obsessed with it. And so I would really encourage people to have such a simple routine that all you think about is there's two parts to every day. What are my fasting hours and what's my eating window? And you just move through your life gently, keeping that and making sure that it works with your life and you feel really well. And then at some point, maybe after three, four, five, six months, if if that dashboard, if all the measures on the dashboard get stuck, right? If you're not seeing any movement, then you're really in your daily fasting groove and you think this is easy for me. I love it. Now I'm going to look at some sort of outside indicator that could let me know a little bit more information about what my body is doing and what it's telling me. And perhaps that gadget 
either a CGM or a Lumen, they do two different things as you know, um, could be, could be helpful for a person to take on, but right now have feel amazing, have it work with your life and start moving the needle on some of the, the, the measures that are important to you. And then add the gadget later. If you need to, it's too upsetting for people. They get a little crazy about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can see going in different directions and I can see it a really good place to start with the fasting because it is easier, right? It is easier than trying to look at a gadget. And then, yeah, if you're starting to find some, some issues, which kind of, I did have with the fasting and that's why I went to the lumen <laughs> you know, so it's it's definitely how I would recommend looking at gadgets is if you're not getting results, try something different, see what can help. And, and it definitely gave me a lot of incredible insights into what was going on with stress and, and what my yes. body would do. But I do agree that fasting is easier for the system. There's it's kind of a no brainer. You get into the routine and yeah, it's been three weeks now where I'm back on it and it it's easy because I know what um timing I, I I think probably one of the things I wanted to ask because I don't have this um food addiction kind of thing in, in mm -hmm. this way, I guess you could say where I feel like, oh my gosh, cutting myself off from food during a certain time frame. I don't have that. What 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 is it like for your clients that you know, what I'm trying to do is shed a little light because I know a lot of people I'll talk to would be like, I, I can't, I can't imagine going four or five hour, you know, that long and or that short of a window. Right. And, and you're saying start with 12. What would you say if someone's like, oh my God, I can't even think about 12. Oh yeah. 12 is hard for some people because many people drink flavored drinks right up until they go to bed at midnight or one. <laughs> and then maybe they wake up at 6.30 you know, they're already sleep deprived. And so when they open their eyes and have to drag themselves out of bed, they really do need some sort of sweet coffee to wake them up. And that's suddenly like a six, they only were fasting for as long as they were sleeping. So to get from, you know, like a six and a half hour fast, which is when you were sleeping to 12 hours means adding three hours on either side of that sleep. And that is hard for many people to imagine. So that's when we, we go gradually, we figure out which is going to be easier for this person to shave time off the nighttime or shave time off the morning. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then we just start pushing it back and then we, we start to one thing that can make a huge difference in shrinking the eating window is m establishing a new habit of eating and a meal. An actual meal, you know, people out there like, oh, I never eat a, an actual meal. I just grab something on the go. And then I have a bowl of microwave popcorn and call it dinner. And I, an energy bar and a protein shake and nobody's eating, you know, and some chips are in the car and nobody's eating actual meal. Mm -hmm. So if then it seems like the work we need to do is what would be a little meal? It could be tiny. It could be slice of cheese and a hard boiled egg and a few olives and a pickle and a dollop of hummus on a tiny little plate. And you sit down, you sit and you eat that until you feel satisfied. And it might take five minutes, but you sit and eat and pause. And then you drink plain water and you see how long you can go until you have your next, could be a giant meal or a little meal, but you go stretch that space by drinking plain water in between those meals. And if you can get four or five hours without eating and you sit down and you tell yourself, I'm waiting for the next meal to eat. I mean, most people who were born in the 1960s and before remember a time when there were no snacks and yeah. our parents said, you can't have a snack. You have to, you know, you've got to be hungry for dinner. You don't spoil your dinner. Okay. So spoiling your dinner means snacking and not being hungry for dinner time. Uh -huh. So we want to actually eat, relearn. We want our bodies to remember what it's like to actually eat a meal, feel satiated, drink water, go about our life, either close the eating window or wait until the next meal. And then if a person can practice having a meal, pause, a meal, pause, a meal, pause, 
then we can start thinking about when are you going to close that eating window and when could you push it out in the morning? And <clears throat> that, that whole process could take about a month for someone. And, uh, but for most people, they can get to an eight hour eating window <clears throat> within two weeks, a week or two. And then if you're practicing the clean fast and keeping an eight hour eating window or less, you will become fat adapted, meaning you'll use up all the stored sugar in your body and you'll flip this metabolic switch and you'll become, you'll shift from being a person who's a sugar burner to being a fat burner naturally. And then that it just gets a lot easier after that. And from there, you can use the second month to figure out what eating window really feels well to you and works with your life. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. One of the one of the pillars I that I've heard you say over and over again is making sure it fits with your life. Now, another thing I talk a lot about just in general with my my clients is that we're we're always changing. Our bodies are shifting. And this is something else that I thought, well maybe this is one of the things that may have went from when fasting was doing all right for me in terms of my my window and what I was up to and why things shifted. For me, it was my hormones have dropped off. Like I, I've gone to another phase closer to menopause. Have you noticed that sometimes we need to change our routine based on what's going on health-wise? Absolutely. And so this is why when a person starts and really settles in and can tune into what has you feel your best, you have a heightened discernment of what foods feel good to your body, what timing feels good to your body, anything that changes, you are more aware. So one of the benefits of being an intermittent faster and having an eating window is we have a clearer understanding of what makes us feel well and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Whereas mostly people are in a fog and believe it or not, drinking flavored drinks and eating all the time creates that fogginess that dragged down feeling. And so because we're fasting clean and having an eating window, we are clearer. So one obvious change is for a woman who's having her cycle is that for some women, not all, but for some women, the days before her period comes, she is really hungry. And so then on those days, just open up your eating window and have it be a little longer and try really hard to eat more healthful nutrient dense food that feels really satisfying to the body. And I know that mostly we want to eat things that aren't so good for us during those days because there's emotion and, and uh, fluctuation in hormones and the, the hunger can surge in, but that's a natural thing that changes. And when someone is setting out to move the needle on the scale or some other health markers, they can feel like those days are a setback. But this is what we really need to learn and apply, which is I am learning a new rhythm of tuning in to my own body's uh, cycles and needs. And believe it or not, when you're a person who fasts clean and has an eating window and knows what it's like to feel really good, anytime something changes, that's more obvious to us. So the other thing that's really helpful emotionally is when we just eat and eat all the time and drink flavored drinks all the time, <clears throat> we are now people who are emotional eaters. Imagine our ancestors, there was not, there was insufficient food. So there was no such thing as being an emotional eater. But when you are a new intermittent faster and you establish this clean fasting hours and that eating window time. And some, let's say something upsetting happens to you in the morning and your eating window isn't open yet. We learn new ways to cope with stress and upset and sadness and loneliness and anger and boredom uh, other than immediately reaching for food. And it's a much healthier way to deal with our emotional upsets, to take a walk or to have a run or sit quietly and meditate or journal or snuggle with your pet or drink a glass of water um, is a much healthier way to cope with stress than diving into mindlessly into some food. And so having an eating window really helps with that. 
I can imagine. I mean, I can imagine. I think part of what I think about too, when we're talking about flavored drinks, flavored things, I mean, a lot of it's chemicals too that, it that is. we have in that mix to, to do that. And so we're also, you know, depending on what people want to believe it with the food industry, I mean, I, I sincerely believe that they create things that cause more of an addiction to these foods. So part of, part of, Part of the big issue that I have found is with the chemical foods, the artificial flavorings, you know, the Mia, like the little drops with all the dyes and all that. I mean, I, I feel like not only is that messing with someone's food addiction, let's put it that way, or or, or craving someone to, addict, you know, be more addicted to the food, but I'm also thinking that we've got the chemical makeup in there. And what's going on with the gut microbiome with that too? Ooh, Yeah. The more <clears throat> we can eat real, actual food, the better. And I know that one of the things you said in the beginning of our conversation today is like you were having some reactions to things and feeling like, I'm not even sure what I can eat right now. I think that's a, a really common feeling that people have. There's a lot of food confusion. And so if we can start eliminating things like crackers and chips and, and colored and flavored drops in things you know, one of the things, the complaints that people have about intermittent fasting, they're like, it's so boring. Oh my gosh. Imagine though, celebrating being bored. It's stop entertaining ourselves with a little drop of this, a little bite of that, a little, the food noise is deafening. The cravings are deafening. And if we can, it's really binary. They're the fasting hours. It's quiet and boring. You can go about your life and pay attention to things that really matter to you and are important to you. And then you get to eat later in your eating window and the discovery of the foods that make us feel better is really exciting and important. And I categorize food in four columns or quadrants, if you will. I have people start to identify their trigger foods, foods that when they eat them, they're off and running. They can't just eat a bite that, that this leads to that. So trigger foods, everybody kind of knows what they are and you might discover some new ones. The second category are foods that make you feel poorly. So gassy, bloated, fatigued, puffy, all the, you know, um, foods that make you feel poorly. Um, the foods that you eat when you're rushed and exhausted, like I said earlier, a bowl of popcorn and call it dinner. You know, that is not dinner. <laughs> okay, So there's not enough nutrients and variety in that to call it dinner, but that's what we do. So getting tuned into the foods you eat when you're rushed and exhausted and then the fourth cat, well, all those first three are the no thank you foods, but we got to identify them. And then the fourth column are the foods you love that love you back. Mm -hmm. And we got to build that list. And mostly, you know, if I ask people, what's your favorite meal? When you eat that, you feel satisfied and happy and your body's like, oh my gosh, yum, yum, yum. That was so good. And I, I don't need to eat another bite. And I feel filled up and that's so nourishing and delicious. Most people have a good sense of what those foods are. And mostly they are real whole foods. They're blueberries and sweet potatoes and steak and salmon and oranges and, you know, and Greek yogurt. So mostly people know which foods have them feel really well and eating a whole bag of chips while you're cooking dinner. You know, there are habits that we could start to notice that we're doing and shift those habits. So the good news is one so much good news, but one of the good aspects is when we're fasting clean and it's boring healing hours where you just go about your life. And then in that eating window, our habits get really amplified and highlighted. Like the, the habits that we have around food that really don't serve us. They get, they get highlighted when they're in this concentrated amount of time and people start noticing for themselves, like, yeah, that does, that should stop doing that. That's not, doesn't feel good to me. And then it becomes their own observation, their own discovery, their own decision, as opposed to me telling them what they should be doing. <laughs> it's so much better. It's so much better when yeah. it's discovered by, by the individual, not, not someone like us, for sure, for sure. Now, one of the things that I hear a lot, and I know we talked about it briefly in our previous podcast, was the protein situation. Because yeah. a lot of people, when they're cutting down their their eating windows, they're trying to figure out how am I going to get in all of this protein? How am I going to be able to, you know, meet the needs that I've been told I need? 
What is your take on protein? What is your take on protein powders? What's your take? I, I'd love to hear like what you've seen folks be successful with and and things of that nature, just out of curiosity. So we've got to look at what people are currently eating. Okay. So if someone's eating all ultra processed food and chips and sandwiches and cereal, and you know, it's, it's uh, we want to take a close look at what you're currently eating. Then we want to recognize that each person's bio individuality, each person metabolizes protein, fat, and carbohydrates with the three macronutrients differently in different proportions. Some people need more fat. Some people need more protein. Some people need more fiber. Let's call it, you know, as opposed to people, when people think carbohydrates, they think pasta and cereal. And we're, I'm talking about broccoli and arugula and oranges and blueberries. So, and kiwis and the list is long seeds and so forth. Okay. So we all process metabolize those macronutrients differently. When we apply a clean fasting schedule and have an eating window, a phenomenon kicks in called appetite correction, the apostat, the appetite center in our brain that regulates our hunger and satiety hormones and other things tells us what to eat and how much to eat. It starts working. It starts going online. It's been offline because we're eating all the time and drinking flavored drinks and drink, eating ultra processed food and confusing it, but it starts working. We are like a wild animal. We don't need to look at a list of food to eat. Our body, just like a wild animal, knows what to eat and how much to eat. And so the next step would be get in an established clean fasting routine and have an eating window that feels great for your body and your life, and then start tuning into those four categories that I said for food, but especially the foods that have you feel amazing that feel very satiating to you. And so experiment with what to eat to open your eating window that feels good. Most people report that a little fat, like a little avocado, a little egg, a little protein, a little tuna, you know, what, whatever feels good to open your eating window, usually protein, fat, and a little vegetable. Um, and then what feels good to have as your main meal. Um, and sometimes a second meal, from there, then we could look at someone could start entering things into their into an app that informs them of what ratios of, you know, fat to protein to carbohydrate they are actually eating and see if they need to make some adjustments. But at that point, most people are really clear about what their body is asking them to have and what their body is losing interest in. I have found so many clients whose doctors or nutritionists and so forth have informed them they need to be getting a lot more protein. So they're, they're stuffing in protein bars and protein shakes and eat it. And they feel bloated and awful and bad about themselves because they're not getting enough that according to the, you know, proteins having a moment. And so I'm much more aligned with respecting our individual bodies and what has us feel amazing and tuning into satiety and eating real actual meals and real actual food, not filling ourselves up on boxes of crackers. And um, then from there, perhaps you could start to measure if something seemed off. Okay. Okay. So sounds like start with fasting, move from there. I mean, it, it makes sense. It's easiest, right? And and it's definitely one of the places I'm I'm definitely gonna go to with a lot of folks in this case and and move from there. Now, in terms of of programs and how they can work with you, how they can get some insight. Let's give them that because I know we talked about it first, but I want to recap again so that folks can can hear where to find you, how they can work with you, how they can build. I'm, <clears throat> my business is called Fast Forward, Fast Forward Wellness, and um, I am heading into my seventh holiday program. So I started my business all those years ago with a bunch of people ended up being 19 people who I got from, as I say, Halloween sweets through New Year's bubbly and beyond. 
never having to diet again in January, never having to diet again, period. And uh, so we start at the end of October and we get established in our eating window, feeling really steady. Uh, uh, What's present is celebration and camaraderie and the four cornerstones of my work, the foundation of having a, a daily fasting schedule and achieving your health goals and getting through the holidays, feeling amazing and arriving in the new year, not you know, being mad at yourself are uh, the clean fast, curiosity, customization, and continuing. And so once we have all four of those in place, people are, are feeling really, really good. And if someone's hearing this after the holiday program starts, you can go to my website and reach out to me. And I work with people one-on-one. And I also have a membership where we have a monthly fast chat and I have group programs. So I, I figured out all the ways that are great for people to work with me and also great for me to enjoy my life as a coach because every minute of it is awesome. I love the one-on-one and I love the group. So there, it's both. It's all really fun for me. <laughs> Well, you know what, that's important, obviously, to keep the career going. But also, you know, I can tell just how much you're you're into it. And and the, you know, insights you gave to me too, just to think about things when I shared kind of what was going on in my world. So I sincerely appreciate it. And yeah, look forward to seeing what comes of of things as I continue through this uh, journey in life. It's awesome. (laughs) Thank you for your great work. Well, thank you, Lori. I appreciate it. Thanks, Janine. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.